Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome, and thank you everyone for taking the time to join us for our panel on transition to practice, focus on impact. We have two amazing panelists with us here today, Dr. Danny Goroff and Mr. Chris Ramming, who will be sharing their experiences in transition to practice. Our panelists bring industry, academic, federal government, and nonprofit experience, and will discuss their viewpoints and expertise, along with advice on how to improve the transition to practice ecosystem in order to achieve the broadest possible impact. I'm Linda Molnar, and I'm currently a program director for the NSF Convergence Accelerator, which was launched in the office of the director and is now part of the new Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships TIP directorate. My education and career are the result of my core belief that science and technology can solve humanity's greatest challenges. I'm a scientist and entrepreneur with experience in translating fundamental research into products and businesses. I've worked across multiple disciplines and sectors spanning international, government, industry, venture capital, and startup environments. This began with my PhD work in sustainable development, which is patented then the translation of exploratory R&D businesses at Roman Haas and the launch of the cancer nanotechnology program back in the mid 2000s. This was a convergent translational research program, the first at NIH, where I had primary responsibility for the eight centers for cancer nanotechnology that were all around the United States. This first translational research program at the NIH led to the establishment of the much larger consortium of 60 clinical and translational science centers. I've started, advised, and invested in numerous biotechnology startups in San Francisco and Boston. I've been at the Convergence Accelerator since January of 2020, where I have responsibility for one of the 2019 pilot cohorts, Artificial Intelligence in the Future of Work, also known as Track B. We made great strides in track integration where we have developed a framework for what we call Step Up the skills-based talent ecosystem platform for upskilling. I invite you to visit the Track B integration booth later today. Also over a series of four Convergence Accelerator workshops, which you may have heard about in the interview that Dr. Douglas Mon gave, I have also developed one of the most recent tracks, Track I, Sustainable Materials for Global Challenges. Track I is unique and it is partnered with Australia. This was the first ever memorandum of understanding between NSF and Australia. The overarching goal of the NSF Convergence Accelerator program is to support cohorts of teams to deliver high impact solutions that meet societal needs and have an impact after NSF support ends. Inherent in delivering solution based on fundamental research is the concept of transition to practice. While transition to practice could simply mean commercialization of a product or the formation of for profit startup, at the NSF Convergence Accelerator, we're focused on societal impact. Thus, our discussion today will consider additional avenues for transition to practice, such as transition to policymakers and policy, and how these investments can ultimately lead to a broader societal and economic benefits by incentivizing use inspired research earlier in the research and development process. We will discuss challenges and opportunities as well as our vision for a seat at the table for everyone, whether they're interested in fundamental research, entrepreneurship, commercialization, investing, et cetera, so that we have a aligned ecosystem with this common thread of societal benefit. Our goal is to create a virtuous cycle where transition to practice activities can feed into basic research. Thus, instead of a valley of death, we create what we call ramp of opportunity for engagement with tech programs. Our panelists will now take you um, some time to introduce themselves, and each of them will answer the question, what does transition to practice mean to you? So we're gonna start um, with Danny, who is from the Sloan Foundation. Go ahead, Danny. Here I am. Can I, you can hear me, yes? Okay. Yes. Terrific. Um, so I'm Danny Goroff, and uh, I am a recovering academic. Um, I taught for many, many years at university, uh, but I've also done work at um, in uh, Washington, D.C. I worked at OSTP twice. Uh, 
um, the House of Science and Technology Policy, of course, in the White House. And I've also had the privilege of working at uh, NSF, uh, most recently as a division director. Um, and uh, I'm still a senior advisor for the uh, TIP directorate and help out there on a very, very part-time basis when I can. Uh, but uh, um, in addition to being a, a huge fan of the Convergence Accelerator and uh, just very impressed by everything that uh, people associated with all of this do, um, my main job these days is that I work at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. I've been here uh, for about a dozen years and uh, I'm the vice president and program director. My, uh, the, well, I hope that people know something about the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, but let me just um, tell you uh, that it was, founded by, guess who, Alfred P. Sloan uh, in 1934. And he's the gentleman who put together and ran General Motors. Um, and he asked, he also started the Sloan School of Management and Memorial Sloan Kettering, but he specifically asked the foundation to support research and a little bit of outreach on science, technology, and economics. And given that, th that those are the three things we're supposed to be studying, science, technology, and economics, the economics of science and technology is a particularly natural topic for us. And included in all of that it are these questions about impact. So we really do want to understand how it is that science and technology comes to uh, have this kind of effect on the world and for economic growth, for commercialization, for policy uses, for all of these different kinds of things. Um, I, uh, uh, and and um, I took that experience um, and uh, was able to go to Intel, uh, where I was asked to help rethink some of the academic engagement programs, um, which I tried to do a little bit based on um, insights from my from my time at DARPA, um, and and so um, you know it's. Interesting to think about Intel and the impact of the semiconductor industry on, on computing. Um, it's, a, it's a company that is well known, not just for driving Moore's law, um, so-called law, um, but also one which uh, really, um, for the first time while I was there, started to take um, sort of a direct responsibility for how computing would be expressed um, in industry. We were shifting from the era of uh, Denard scaling, frequency scaling to, um, to multi-core scaling. And it was something that people didn't know how to deal with. How would, how would we maintain you know, the uh, every other year benefits of new processor technology when um, we couldn't take advantage of simple frequency scaling to improve end user performance? So um, we did a lot of work there, which was really meant not just to transition into a specific product or service, but um, more into the everyday practices of the whole computing industry. Um, and of course, uh, Intel is also well known for pioneering new workloads that would uh, take advantage of the ever increasing um, cap capabilities of its processors. So, so that was an interesting experience. Um, and uh, I, I, I finally um, have been at VMware for about seven years. Um, and um, I, my role here is to help, um, to help drive organic innovation um, as a complement to uh, acquisitions and other ways of growing the company. And so I've sort of continued this, uh, this sort of um, trajectory of working at the intersection of research and practice. I'm responsible here for our academic engagement um, program, which is one of the sources of new ideas um, for ourselves and for the industry. Um, and I'm responsible for an uh, an incubator, uh, very much a tech push incubator that, uh, in fact, it's called Vortex, which is shorthand for research, VMware research translation. And we try to take ideas and inventions um, from our internal research group or from our, uh, our work with academic partners and realize new products and services. Um, and so this is all about um, transition to practice. And so I hope we have a little chance to sort of discuss some of those uh, related insights later on in this discussion. 
Absolutely. Um, but first, uh, what I wanted to do is go back to Danny and talk a little bit about, I'm, I'm intrigued by what he brought up about this idea of, of science um, to sort of serve policymakers and decision makers, right? Uh, what information would they need to, to make these broad decisions? And in that context, you know, how, and I know you have some experience with this um, as well, how can we incentivize researchers to get involved in that type of work? Right, so, um, so let me emphasize that at the uh, Sloan Foundation, you know, our trustees really are interested in impact and they are interested in this kind of translation even though a lot of what we're doing is, is funding pretty basic uh, academic research. And uh, so we get asked all the time about various kinds of ideas and notions and products that people might have in mind and uh, concepts, experiments, and, and especially data sets. And uh, people are sending us ideas all the time for uh, things that they think that someone in the world should be interested in. And um, basically that's really not good enough. Um, the idea that somebody should be interested in it, even if it sounds like a terrific idea, isn't, um, it, 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 doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't get us all excited until we hear about uh, somebody who actually wants to use this and knows that they want to use this. So this is the kind of question that we ask of, of people who come to us with uh, ideas all the time. Um, you know, and it, it boils down to use cases uh, and not just a notional use case that, that uh, as I said, somebody should be interested in this, but someone who actually is, knows that they're interested in it and wants to work with you on um, developing into this into something that will serve their needs. And they're willing to get involved with that early on. So that's one of the criteria that we look for. And also we're, we um, ask a lot about uh, sustainability plans and what that might look like. So uh, very often, again, academics just, they wanna write their next paper and they wanna um, uh, you know, do this little project, but they, thinking about the long-term, is not so easy, and in, and in particular, in part because of the uh, the way that Sloan does support work on science, technology, and economics, we're uh, not afraid of economic solutions to these kinds of, of uh, sustainability issues, namely ones that involve market mechanisms and people earning money and other things like that, um, and a lot of other foundations that are also working for the public good really kind of shun those mechanisms, and, and we don't. Uh, you know, it's, it, there are lots of different ways in which um, it, it might make sense for somebody to, to make money or to do something else with an academic idea. And uh, that's, that's actually, you know, very, very useful sometimes, but not necessarily the way that academics uh, start thinking about things. And, and that's what we do. Oh, thank you for that response, Danny. I mean, I can certainly relate to that. I know in the Convergence Accelerator, we often we, we talk about it as use-inspired research, right? And engaging with end users early on. Um, and that's a big part of the phase one of our program that we run. Um, and at my time at NIH and doing clinical translational work, you know, we were also often driven by the needs of, of patients. And, and patient advocates. And that was a, a natural way to engage um, with the end use and, and application. Um, that said, you know, I have been in Silicon Valley where I was at a very nascent startup back in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And we had trouble even in that scenario, sometimes incentivizing the fundamental researchers to get involved into, in translational work. And so, Chris, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your experience, I know you came to VMware relatively recently, but that company was, I think, founded in 1998 as, as a startup from Berkeley and now has some over 37,000 employees. So in that scenario, how do you incentivize what I would call uh, certainly the, more the intrapreneur than an entrepreneur? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I wanna first thank the uh, National Science Foundation for 
funding um, Mendel Rosenblum's work, he mentions um, in his final re final final uh, report for the career award he had, it was called a Young Investigators Award at the time, um, that some of the ideas that he um, he developed, um, you know, had had been used to create this startup called VMware, and um, so. Uh, you know, very, very fertile time for uh, NSF investments. Google and uh, VMware both came out of a similar um, round of investments at, at Stanford and, and both have um, had significant impact on the industry. So um, re research translation through um, uh, research translation through startups is something that we pay careful attention to. Um, you know, given our own history, um, and uh, I should note that you know, we've acquired uh, many faculty-led startups, um, and um, and as I did a survey of our, of the faculty that we work with on a regular basis, thirty-five of them are also founders of startups. So a huge number of the people that we work with um, believe that uh, working through startups is uh, is an effective uh, approach to research translation. And so one, one thing that um, we think about on, on our side of the equation is that we'd like to grow both through the acquisition of other companies and through the development of our own internal technologies. So, so what, does that, what, does that, what does it mean that um, so many of our faculty partners are entrepreneurs? Um, what it means is that there are multiple avenues of research translation and uh, we need to sort of work together to figure out which of them is most appropriate. In some cases, um, the founder wishes to um, express their ideas and bring them to market um, on their own. Um, sometimes we are able to partner with uh, those startups and, and help them find uh, customers or work with us on integrations. Um, and, then, and then there are other cases where um, the faculty um, member you know, would, would prefer not to uh, engage in all of the overhead of creating a startup. And in those cases, there's a different kind of relationship that we can create. Um, so that's one, one trend that I think is really interesting and it requires us all to be very thoughtful about what are the circumstances and mechanisms in which we engage and would we like to see some of these um, uh, uh, you know, government funded and academic originated ideas coming to market one way or the other. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation and an important one to have early so that you can pave the way for it. Um, so that's, that's, that's one, well, sorry, Linda, go ahead. Oh no, I was just say it certainly, it certainly is. And it's just very interesting to think about the different ways that uh, a larger company like yours sort of create that ecosystem for transition to practice. And, you know, instead of, you know, people talk about the valley of death, right? Because there's so much incentives to stay doing fundamental research for some of the academic folks, that how do we incentivize them to, you know, cross that and form companies? And I just want to bring up the point that that may be relatively easy for folks um, in an ecosystem such as where Stanford and VMware are located. Um, how can we help incentivize others in, in other regions. And I would argue, even in that case where it's Stanford and Silicon Valley, um, you know, is there more we can do to incentivize and support this, this use inspired research in a way that we get even more out of our investment from fundamental research? Because ultimately, I think that's what we all want in terms of either commercializing and, and the economic benefits that come from that or the things that Danny was talking about for Sloan Foundation. Yeah, maybe if I could just make a brief comment on that. Um, uh, I wanted to also sort of talk about sort of the pure corporate path to, um, to research translation. Um, because, mm -hmm. you know, not every uh, inventor, not every originator of an idea that extends the frontiers of human knowledge wants to go off and, and do that commercialization and take care of all of those details. So um, I mentioned earlier that we have a, a, an incubator. It's our the third generation of incubator we have here, and we're running two concurrently. One is sort of a little bit more sort of market pull in its nature, and, and the one that I'm responsible for is very much a tech push thing, where we start with um, an idea, a, a mm -hmm. research idea, and try to figure out what could that idea be when it grows up. Um, and you know, Danny, um, you, you you talked a little bit about um, uh, you know design partners and finding people who are willing to explore things. Uh, we have a 
pretty simple recipe for these internal um, these internal incubations. Um, you know, they need to build a prototype. They need to go find a design design partner and, and sort of um, work on what we call product market fit. To, you know, evolve the technology towards the direction that the customer cares about and understand what that is. Um, so, so there's a there's a, a literal translation um, of an idea that starts in maybe some pure form, but needs to be adapted to the way the world thinks about that innovation. Um, and um, you know, after some iteration with a design partner, it's possible to sort of say, this idea is investable or not, it should become a product mm -hmm. or a service. Um, and so like DARPA, we just basically try to take the technical and the business risks off the table with our incubations. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, that's another kind of mechanism that can be used um, to help bridge this, um, this valley, valley of death that you're describing mm -hmm. and sort of discover um, what is the interface between the research idea and what the world mm -hmm. really needs at that particular moment in the evolution of industry and that point in history. Yeah, we had a question in the chat from Stephen that really gets at this, and I wanted to bring up this idea that, you know, also, uh, Chris, you know, what about the things that are seen as commercially viable and then they move forward, but then there are also these amazing learnings that you get when you start to apply new technologies to different areas, and those can be fed back into fundamental research and really create a virtuous cycle so that we are really thinking a more expansive way and getting as much value as we can from the research that we're doing. And so Stephen had asked this question, how helpful or harmful is it to define a target customer in these cases early in the technology development process? And he said he felt it was answered, I think by Danny. I just wanted to add to that though, that um, you know, this is this is a big point of discussion, right? When, when do you, that point, when do you create the startup and move the technology out of the university into the startup company? When do you decide to license it? How much should it be developed? And, I've certainly found that very early stage, those very first steps of transition to practice to be very exciting because when you start to test technologies in use cases, then you, um, you begin to see where that technology can really shine and maybe be commercialized or where there are some challenges and, you need, and it spawns new areas of fundamental research. So Danny, I saw you give a nod, maybe you wanted to add to that a little bit. Well, I. I I was going to pick up. I, I mean, again, I think um, much of this is is familiar to people who who have done a lot of commercialization, and to many academics who are compiling a useful database or some other kind of a, a app or whatnot. Um, you know, it, it may not necessarily dawn on them uh, that it's so important to have these users and use cases in mind uh, for inspiration. Um, but I wanted to pick up very specifically and uh, just. Uh, tell a quick story about the importance of uh, first customers and having a first customer in mind as you work, even from the very beginning. Uh, and um, I think that that's part of the, the, many people have written about what the secret is of DARPA and the fact that they only have program officers for a certain number of years or something like that. I think the most important part of DARPA's success is that they have DOD behind them. As a first customer. And uh, similarly, I too worked at Bell Labs uh, for a while when I was, uh, when I was young. And um, the idea that AT&T was behind as a first customer made a huge difference. And uh, my friend Bill Janeway recently told me the following story about why Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley and not Germanium Valley because uh, it, it appears that um, in the very beginning, lots of people were working on chips that were based on germanium, which after all has many, many actually better qualities than silicon. And it is a natural thing to, to, uh, to, try, to try to use for these kinds of uh, applications. But um, the Air Force came along at the beginning and said, oh, that's very nice what you're doing with germanium. But you do know that it melts at high temperatures. And so that won't do. And you, you got to stop doing that. We won't buy it. Um, you better use silicon instead. And so that's the reason why we have Silicon Valley instead of Germanium Valley. And it's because a very important first customer was able to talk about their needs in a very compelling way 
and uh, you know the rest is history. So I, I think that that having a having first customers in mind from the beginning is really essential. Now that's a really really great comment. I know in the Convergence Accelerator Phase One curriculum, we talk about low fidelity prototyping, right? So getting that science to a point where then you can get it to a customer and get that very critical feedback very early on in the process. That's that's fantastic to hear. Um, so Chris, I wanted to go back to you because you started to touch upon this idea and I, Danny, you mentioned this as well. That, so there are some folks, we all know the scientists, maybe they just really want to stay in the lab. They don't have uh, an interest in a uh, broader view of transition to practice, but you know, that work is obviously still very valuable. That's the engine that drives the innovation, right? We don't want to stop doing that. And how can we figure out how to sort of get everybody sitting at the right seat at the table? Because we have some folks who are really inclined to do that fundamental work. Other folks who are very entrepreneurial. It sounds like at VMware, you created opportunities for folks all along that gamut to sort of thrive in your organization. Um, I, yeah, I think we do try. Um, the you know one one. I, I want to tell a, another story to sort of um, follow follow Danny's about uh, Germanium Valley, um, and that is about um, the. It, it's a story about how long it takes for an idea to evolve, and how in the course of an idea, um, it, 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 it responsibility passes from sometimes from industry to government, um, uh, uh, um, to academia. And the idea evolves and develops and um, exists in sort of a broad trajectory of in, in invention and innovation. And so uh, one, of the, one of the stories that I've uh, looked at um, involves software defined networking, which is an important part of our business. And it's interesting to me to see the roots of that in a DARPA ISAT study in 1995, and then to see the evolution of that um, in, uh, in academia with um, investments uh, that the NSF made and uh, Intel Corporation made in something called Planet Lab that was very influential in the networking community as a, as a source of ideas, um, which then um, you know, generated uh, new thinking about um, something called Genie, which was sort of a combination of a research platform and a test bed, and how that um, generated ideas, um, including um, a startup uh, called Nicira, um, again out of uh, Berkeley and Stanford, um, that you know we ended up acquiring. Um, and and what I've observed is that that these ideas, um, you know, exist in a, in a broad um, in a broad uh, historical context that takes many decades and sometimes in some cases to unfold. Mm -hmm. And during the course of that, um, you, you asked Linda about how idea, how, how people stay involved um, and how mm -hmm. the ideas cycle, cycle back. And so I think, I think it's really important to recognize that um, there are many opportunities and many points in time for people with different interests to participate in this process in the way that is best suited for their, for their particular interests. Um, so it doesn't have to, be, it's not sort of a make or break you know, moment. And I think um, we should be thinking about more than just individual um, products and services, but thinking more right. about how to shape whole industries with these in, in innovations. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's the essence of convergence research that we talk about. I've seen this in the biotech industry. You know, we'd sequenced uh, the genome back in the early 2000s, all that was happening, but it wasn't until many years later that we had the artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to really analyze that data to get to um, clinical decision-making type technologies, right? So, so things, technologies come and go, right? And then new technology comes in and it affects different technologies in that ecosystem. And I think we really do need to think about how we can cultivate this sort of these convergent research ideas that actually establish entirely new fields and industries. And um, I'm actually gonna go to one of the questions in the chat because, well, Chris, you have the benefit of working um, with a bunch of uh, very entrepreneurial academics. Um, maybe Danny has a comment on this, that you know we still have this, these divisions, these academic silos, and um, how can we um, 
how can we break down you know, those barriers and really help support this more interdisciplinary convergent work? And um, you know, I guess that's probably an answer really for me. I mean, we try to have programs like the Convergence Accelerator. We offer the curriculum to support the PIs uh, in the accelerator to help sort of de-silo these things. But Danny, maybe you have a comment on how foundations like Sloan can play a role. I, I know we spoke in the in the prep call about um, having enormous impact on policymakers, for instance. Um, yeah. Um, let me say that we can learn some principles about how that how this works sometimes by going to the extreme cases and we're just talking about very long-term ones. Uh, but I think we can also talk about a few very urgent ones where people um, really need to address problems uh, very, very urgently. Um, and I think that, that, that as, uh, one of the lessons is that as a sense of purpose and a sense of urgency from the beginning and need really goes a long way. But I'll, I'll just say a, an example of that that came out of the uh, pandemic. Um, and it's called Sean. It's the Societal Experts Action Network. And um, there were lots of academics running around with all kinds of ideas when the pandemic broke out. Some of them were pretty silly, but some of them were actually kind of brilliant. And, mm -hmm. um, and they had no idea what to do with them. Uh, they, they, everybody thought, well, I guess I'll try to get an op-ed piece in the New York Times. And that was all mm -hmm. they could think of to try to put it out Meanwhile, there were governors, mayors, and other officials who had all sorts of problems and really needed help and knew that they needed help, um, but they had no idea who to trust or where to turn or what to do. Um, one governor told me that they had uh, called up their college roommate because they majored in social science and thought that they might be able to help them find people who knew something about this, who, who they could trust. Uh, right. So what we did is we set up an organization called Sean based at the National Academy of Science and there were two main things about it. One is that we started with the questions that the governors and the mayors and the decision makers actually had. Not with what the academics thought were good ideas or anything else like that, start with the decision makers. And then not as a metaphor, but very literally, we put in place translators, people who had worked both in policy and in academic research and who could take the questions that uh, these decision makers had and turn them into the sort of thing that an academic could understand. Then we turn those over to uh, the National Bureau for Economic Research, the Social Science Research Council, the National Hazards uh, Center, people who knew a lot about this and said, don't write us an academic paper. Just within a few days, within a, a week at most, get us a bunch of bullet points, get us some references, get us the best things that you can to answer this. And then the translators went to work on that again to turn it back into a decision memo of the sort that no academic knows how to write, but that good translators can actually do and put that in front of the policymakers. The end of the story is that there were um, dozens of these uh, rapid expert consultations that were put out there were um, 30,000 downloads of them. There were thousands and thousands of decision makers who came to webinars where the results and the advice of this were, were shown. And of, of those uh, two thirds of the decision makers who, who participated said that it actually changed a policy, it changed the decision, it changed something that they were doing. So the mm -hmm. principles are, again are to have a really strong sense of purpose that, that uh, certainly the pandemic provided. Um, the second thing is to start with the decision makers and uh, really get from them what they think that they need uh, rather than starting with the academics. And uh, the third thing is to really build in translation, not as a metaphor, but as a real service and as uh, find the people who are skillful in doing that and make sure that they're in place and part of the system from the beginning. Yes, and you know, Chris, uh, I wondered if you could share, I know you've had some experience uh, co-funding things uh, with NSF and use that as a type of incentive because essentially, you know, Danny, that's an amazing story, right? You're helping scientists achieve this enormous 
uh, impact through that type of work. And there are folks who wanna be connected to that. So Chris, can you say a little more in just the few minutes we have remaining? Well, one of the things that we've been experimenting with um, to putting, putting together uh, communities of people who both understand the research and commercialization aspects is um, joint solicitations with the National Science Foundation. And here, um, uh, joint solicitations are a mechanism that we use when we wanna shine a spotlight on some idea that we think really could benefit the whole industry and help um, make progress on an important issue that needs to be deeper explored. So uh, we, we use joint solicitations in topics like, uh, we did one sustainable digital infrastructure, we're um, involved in one for uh, NextG. Um, we looked at security um, and edge computing. And um, so the, our dream for some of these joint solicitations is to provide um, academic researchers with industry context that helps them shape um, the research that they do um, and to be more likely um, to develop ideas that can be absorbed by the industry. Um, and, um, and then, um, you know, we deeply value the interactions and the collaborations that emerge because um, by hybridizing ideas, we get more powerful ideas. So that's, that's one technique that I think um, is worth exploring more. And um, in answer to the um, comment about question or comment about George Heilmeier, um, and I want to also just put in a sort of cautionary note that as we focus on transition to practice and relevant research, uh, it's really important um, to make sure that we just keep having wild um, invent, you know, inventions and advances to the sum of human knowledge that aren't necessarily known a priori to tie to industry advances. And, and so I think you know, uh, it's, it's fantastic that we're all focusing more on transition to practice, but we also have to make sure that we continue to generate fundamental new ideas um, that change the way we all think about things. Absolutely, Chris. I think that's a wonderful way to end our, our panel, that we're trying to create uh, opportunities uh, for everyone, both from exploratory research and also those who are more interested in commercialization and other types of transition to practice. That's fantastic. Let's thank our panelists and thank uh, everyone for joining us for this brief panel. Um, please uh, have a look at the other uh, expo uh, booths and areas to visit in this remaining uh, half day of the Convergence Accelerator Expo. Thank you.